part, I'm going to shift um, a little bit to talking about a bunch of other analytes other than dopamine. So it feels like whenever we teach fundamental energy chemistry, we always talk about dopamine because it's such a great example analyte. And it's important in the brain, and it's just about perfect, right? Uh, except that there's more than one chemical in the brain, um, and the brain's not all dopamine. Uh, and so, um, you know, we'd like to really use our technique for other things, and I think there's been a lot of research in like the last 10 years to do that. Except we never actually talk about how that electric chemistry really changes or it looks different at different electrodes. And so that's what I'm going to hopefully uh, cover a little bit today. All right, we're going to start though. <laughs> you're like, you're going to start with dopamine. Uh, we're going to start with catecholamines, which is a class of compounds that includes dopamine but has a few friends as well. Uh, so, all right, we have dopamine um, here. All right, so this is dopamine, uh, but in similar in structure to dopamine, we have norepinephrine, and then epinephrine. So the ring structure is the same on all of them. What changes is just um, oh, what you know, each other. That's okay. That's okay. Um, uh, and then this one has a methyl group sticking out of the um, H. Uh, so uh, there's a methyl group on the end of that. This H two is really obvious. Um, uh, so, uh, so this is a um, secondary amine, uh, um, uh, it's the primary amine. So norepinephrine and epinephrine. If you are British or just in a different thing, these are sometimes also called adrenaline and noradrenaline. Those are the same things. Uh, I think the majority of the field use epinephrine, but if you see adrenaline, it's the same thing. And in, in, in norepinephrine, the adjective people usually use is noradrenergic. They don't use norepinephrinergic, probably because you can't even say that. Um, uh, so again, just a little bit. Uh, sometimes when we like to chemist go into neurochemistry, the smallest little like change in like name will trip us up because we're just not nor not used to that vocabulary. So, anyways, I'm going to talk about it as norepinephrine. Okay, so for all of these, right there's oh, well, I'll talk about the catechol means. Um, so the catechol, the catechol is this, it's the structure with the diol, that's the catechol part. And then they all have an amine, right? So that's the catechol amine, uh, just so we get our chemistry. Um, uh, and so they, if they have this structure, this general structure, and you could probably make other things from it. Uh, that's our catechol amine. All right, so again, with dopamine, um, minus two electrons, minus two protons, and we form uh, the orthoquinone uh, species. That's the primary oxidation. Um, and um, that's what happens. And so we're going to do the same thing for all of these. The oxidation isn't going to look any different. Oops. Let's see, that's not perfectly correct. Um, it's not going to look really any different because it's all the ring structure that is the primary oxidation. Man, I've lost all my chemistry. All right, CH3. Um, uh, so, same thing, right? All of these are two electron and two proton oxidations. And so this leads to a bit of a problem. Uh, and the bit of the problem is that the CVs for these would look very similar. Um, and so, um, can I write over here? Yes. Yep. Um, I'm like, I want to save that space for something else. Uh, uh, so if I were to draw a CV, I just want to make sure I can see this on the camera, right? And I've been drawing CVs for dopamine that look like this. But the problem is, if I drew a CV for norepinephrine, it looks something like that. And if I drew a CV for 
for the primary oxidation of epinephrine, it looks something like that. <laughs> so we have a little bit of a selectivity problem in FSCV. We're not really good at telling these apart. Um, and again, at a carbon fiber, they tend to look fairly similar. I'm going to talk about maybe you can tell epinephrine apart, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, okay, so this is tough, right, um, for a selectivity problem. Uh, because again, it's the same ring that's being done, so it's the same. The, the energy is about the same, and we don't have like maybe it's like five, ten millivolts off. We don't have that kind of resolution, right? You know, uh, you know. So it's like it's not going to be maybe exactly the same when you add one orange group, but oh, it's pretty close, and we don't have the resolution to tell them apart. Okay, but there are more reactions that a textbook or another paper tell you could happen, and we don't normally see them, um, and so. I am not going to write them for everything, but I will write them for dopamine um, at the moment. Uh, and so they can undergo what we call a cyclization reaction. Oh, I didn't draw this very well. I'm gonna this. If I redraw it like this, now you can see that you might be able to do a reaction there, uh, you know, kind of thing. And so what you can end up doing is cyclizing. Um, uh, and we cyclize typically uh, to this, um, where we're going to have a five member ring with the nitrogen um, in it. When we do that, this species is called leukodopamine. Uh, but again, we call this a cyclization reaction. And now, when we do that, Um, we're going to end up making a reaction. That one can undergo um, oxidation as well. We got back into a diol, and then you know we can go back and forth there to the. Um, um, uh, uh, um, structure. And so this happens at a lower potential. The potential for this is somewhere around 0.15 volts. Maybe I shouldn't call that E0 because it's called CNFSCB. Um, and so the norepinephrine can do this, and the epinephrine can do it too. Um, epinephrine does it the best because it turns out that that secondary amine is a lot easier um, to react. Uh, and so this one has the most preferred kind of cyclization. Um, turns out this is the least for whatever reason. I'm not sure I can justify that chemically. Uh, that one is the least. This one is the most uh, for making a cyclized product. Turns out we can do one more reaction for epinephrine as well with this. Um, I mean, here we can also um, oxidize that. And when we oxidize that, um, the product that we get um, ends up, again, um, this is my CH3 group. Um, there. So we can oxidize there by the amine. So now this is the only one I've shown you where we've oxidized the side group. All the rest of them we've oxidized the ring. Ring, 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 you know, and then oh, okay, well, actually if you oxidize the side group. This peak happens at 1.3 volts. And actually, if I went back here, I lied a little bit. Sometimes even in a carbon fiber, you can pick up a, um, a peak for the oxidation of that side group at about 1.3. But it turns out if you go to one of our friends, the trapping electrodes, like a carbon nanotube yarn, these like extra reactions now are really easy to see. Um, and so if we do a cyclic voltanogram um, for um, one of these, what we end up getting is often peaks that look like this. Um, Two reduction peaks there, so I'm try and draw that better. Um, okay, my, my 
skills aren't great. Um, uh, so, uh, so we still get a main peak for dopamine, but now we get an extra couple uh, here where this redox couple is due to that cyclization. And so the trapping, again, this can only happen if this has some time to reform into that. And so typically at a carbon fiber, the problem is this will desorb from the surface. And so even if it did cyclize into this, we just don't see it because it's not left on the surface. So now if I get this product, my dopamine orthoquinone, and I get it down in some sort of you know, space between two carbon nanotubes or something like that, um, you know, if I make my dopamine orthoquinone and it goes to the leuco uh, dopamine, I'm just going to call it LDA, right, it's still trapped there. And so now if I want to oxidize this, back and forth between the leukodopamine and the leukodopamine orthoquinone, I can do it. Um, again, a lot of this we figured out, it's, it's easy to explain after the fact, not exactly something I will admit that we uh, knew was going to happen before the fact. Um, and so again, with epinephrine, if you wait a little bit of time, you can use up most of the peak, uh, main peak, and it'll go here, and you'll even get CVs sometimes that look wildly weird, like, oh, you know, just a tiny bit of, you know, primary peak and tons of secondary peak and tons of secondary peak because um, once it gets trapped over here, it doesn't necessarily get back um, all the way over there. Um, so these, this is a useful place to start to see how you get different signals at different electrodes. Again, carbon fiber, they're going to look very similar. We don't see many of these peaks. You know, um, you know, again, it's been in the literature since probably the 70s that you can get these cyclization peaks. But we don't see them because the dopamine orthoquinone falls off. Now, though, if we trap them, we can see them. And so with the um, epinephrine especially, uh, a trapping electrode, the epinephrine really does not look particularly like the dopamine because you're trapping and seeing a lot of these extra um, kind of reactions. Um, so they can be good and bad um, as far as that goes. Um, maybe bad if you're like, oh, I don't want to use up my primary signal, but good if you want to do selectivity. And also, I think in general, these trapping electrodes are just very good for like telling detailed mechanisms of um, different uh, um, reactions. Okay, so that's dopamine and its friends, i.e. the catecholamines. And there are people, if you really, really care about, you know, dopamine and norepinephrine, you would never do FSCB if you wanted to detect them both. So that's a case where you might want a biosensor or some, you know, fluorescence sensor or something more uh, selective. But generally, how we get selectivity in the brain, since I haven't said this, uh, is just that we go to a region that has one and not the other. That's not always true. Uh, and you can also use pharmacology and drugs to kind of pick out things. Um, but that's, that's worked pretty well uh, for the primary experiments people do. All right, let's talk about serotonin for a minute. Um, so serotonin is also another one that people have done uh, for a while. Um, it just has one OH group, and it has already a... nitrogen um, uh, there, and it has a side group. Man, I'm going to fail. Being a chemistry professor. Um, you can tell I don't teach organic. Uh, um, try to keep the right number of carbons and hydrogens. Um, all right, so this is like serotonin. Um, looks a little bit different. Um, serotonin is of a class that are called Indolamines, in case you want to know the correct name, serotonin is not a catecholamine. This is an indol, that's its amine. All uh, right, you know, and so uh, just every once in a while, serotonin in electric chemistry is probably the second most thing that people have studied for sign dopamine. And so every once in a while, people just like throw it in, like, what are a name? If you want a name for all of them, use the word monoamine. Uh, uh, you know, uh, that's what they typically use, mean like kind of one amine on the side chain, which can't use catecholamines, means serotonin. Um, 
All right, if we do two hydrogens and two electrons, we can get um, the diol, as you might expect. Um, so, and that looks just great, um, you know, so we're oxidizing here, we're oxidizing there, um, uh, as well. Uh, and so, that's where my electrons went. But the problem here, uh, is that, and I'm not going to draw out all the polymerization I decided for this, uh, but the problem here is that when you do this, again, if you were really a uh, fundamental electric chemists looking at mechanisms, you would like be like, well, two electrons don't go at once. One goes, then maybe a hydrogen, then another one goes, and then a hydrogen. And so typically this is where it goes first, um, and you often end up making, um, I'm just going to draw this ring over here, or end up making a radical. Uh, so you lose one electron, now I've got some sort of radical on there. And the problem is when you have radicals, they're really reactive, if you remember back to chemistry class. Uh, um, and so these radicals can sometimes interact with each other. And when they interact with each other, again, you can get a dimer, and if you keep oxidizing, you can end up getting a polymer. This will be a common theme. We'll come back to it for other analytes that do this too. Uh, so the serotonin, sure, if it went properly, you'd get a nice kind of balanced reaction. But um, it's tough when you do one, the, you'll see anything that only has one OH on the ring tends to have this radical problem and dimerization problem. I didn't put octopine and tyramine in this lecture, they have the same problem. Histamine, gonna have the same problem. Serotonin has the same problem. So there is some, like if you actually start to study structures, you can perhaps predict when you might have this problem. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's the one OH group that really seems to kill us. Um, and so, People have known for a while that serotonin is substantially more difficult than dopamine in practice because when you make this polymer, if it sticks to the surface, then we get an effect that we call fouling. And so fouling is just when your surface basically goes bad over time. And so, you know, if we were to draw fouling, you know, the current versus time, and ideally, right, your current would stay the same versus time. I inject the same amount of serotonin, I get the same amount, right? But if you get fouling, what you'll see over time, maybe practically, is something like that, uh, right? Where this is fouling, and that pink line was the ideal. Um, and so, again, this isn't anything biological, it's just that our electrode the surface got decreased because I put something on it that wasn't particularly active, electroactive, and it decreases. Um, and so people have known this um, uh, um, for a while. So how do people deal with this fouling? Uh, the typical way that people have dealt with the fouling is to put on a napion coating. And so napion is a perfluorinated polymer, and it's really good at kind of rejecting particularly anions, but also, again, once you have a polymer on the surface, it's just hard to form another polymer on the surface. Um, and so, uh, again, people don't tend to need to naphion coat for dopamine, but they do naphion coat a lot of times for serotonin uh, to get rid of this. So I'm not gonna write out the reactions, but it turns out the main metabolic profile of serotonin is a molecule called 5-HIAA, so 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid, so we make an acetic acid on it. Um, it has similar issues uh, with fouling. It's even worse than serotonin. So 5-HIAA has big time fouling issues. Um, and so what Hashemi found out um, in her research was that in the mammalian brain, it isn't so much that it's the serotonin that kills your electrode, it's the 5-HIAA. Because the serotonin is not, there's not a high basal level and it's not around for that long. 
But the 5-HIA, what you're shunting the metabolism to, there's large amounts of that that stick around and are around for a long time. And so this fouls too. And so in a mammalian brain, uh, with just kind of the normal waveforms, which I'll talk about next, that people use for a while, you couldn't, you can't really, your sensitivity just decreases and the CBs start looking weird and it really is terrible. And it's all really, it's this, it's 5-HIAA. You might know that in the Venton lab, we do a lot of Drosophila experiments and we have never had big serotonin fouling problems. And we believe it's all because the, we don't think the Drosophila make 5-HIAA. Um, it's monoamine oxidase is the enzyme that gets serotonin to 5-HIAA, and they have not found an equivalent of that in the fly. So it's very likely the fly has different degradation in metabolism products, and in this case, as an electric chemist, oh, does that make our life easier. Um, in fact, one time I remember at a meeting, meeting with Kashemi, and she's just like, I don't understand why your signals are beautiful for hours on end, and you don't nap your coat. And then we tried to start talking about her results with 5-HIA, and I said, you know, they think that the fly doesn't have that. And, you know, again, it's always hard to prove something doesn't have something, right? You know, it's like nobody has found the equivalent is the only thing you can say. They think the fly doesn't have this. Uh, I think we have great electrochemical evidence the fly doesn't have it <laughs> because we don't have nearly the problems that they have in the, in the thing, but I can't publish that. Um, uh, you know, that's uh, kind of there. Okay, so let's talk really quickly about... Um, Waveforms for serotonin. So again, if this fouling problem has been known and has been an issue for a while. And so they've developed specialized FSCB waveforms. And so the one that's been most commonly used is the oldest. We often in our lab refer to this as the Jackson waveform because the first author on the paper was Jackson. Because it came out of the Whiteman group, I think, in the mid-90s. Um, and they found that it was better to hold at a positive potential. So they hold at plus 0 0.2. They go up to 1.0 volts, down to minus 0 0.1 volts, and then back to positive 0 0.2 volts. Also, to outrun fouling, they decided to go up to 1,000 volts per second. These different, this waveform is sometimes called an N-shaped waveform or maybe a flying W, I don't know, depending on what letters you see in that. Um, uh, but it is possible to not just do a triangle, but to go up, you know, and then come back down to get the production, that kind of thing. If you did that, again, a signal for serotonin might look something like this, where the reduction peak, um, different than dopamine. So the, let me draw dopamine on this just so you can see what dopamine would look like comparatively. Um, so yeah, the orange here is supposed to be dopamine where the brown I drew was serotonin. By the way, the chemical name for serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptamine. -tryptamin. So you'll also see it abbreviated 5-HT. I once worked with a student who had no idea why they called the serotonin receptors 5-HT1A, 1B. I was like, oh, that's just another name for serotonin, right? Uh, so again, the vocabulary sometimes escapes us of electrochemists. Um, same thing. Uh, so you see the reduction peak is shifted by about 200 millivolts um, compared to dopamine. But the um, oxidation peaks are very similar, so it's hard to tell them apart there. I will say that if you are an astute electrochemist, you might determine that the, actually the serotonin peaks tend to be narrower than the dopamine peaks do on there. I drew that on purpose like that. Uh, that wasn't a mistake. Um, I don't know why uh, that is exactly, uh, but that you tend to see uh, something like that. But if, if we were doing this waveform, I didn't do this well. You would start here, you'd go up, you'd come back, you'd see that, and you'd come back to there. Uh, um, I, I didn't actually draw it. Oh, properly, uh, but, you know, so um, you can do that with the Jackson waveform. So this has been used for a while. And again, with this, people do tend to nap the on coat. Um, I drew dopamine on there just so we could see what it looks like. This waveform is, however, fairly highly selective for serotonin. Um, and that is because, which we discussed in my previous lecture where I talked about holding potential, Dopamine hates a positive holding potential. Dopamine wants that negative holding potential to be able to absorb. Uh, serotonin doesn't seem to be as affected. Maybe its double ring structure allows it to absorb anyways without, uh, it's still positively charged, but it, it, you see a lot more signal for serotonin 
than you do for dopamine um, with a positive uh, switching potential. So that allows it to have some selectivity. Um, but our lab, Kelly down there in my lab, has come up with some newer uh, serotonin waveforms. I'm going to throw one up here called the Extended Serotonin Waveform, or ESW. And so when Whiteman invented, and Jackson invented that waveform that we had um, here, there were some instrumental limitations, and basically nobody went above one volt. Right? It just didn't happen. Then we discovered, hey, we can go above one volt. And we get some interesting things that happen to the surface. And yet, for whatever reason, nobody's gone back to look at the serotonin waveform. It's like, well, that's the serotonin waveform, right? Uh, and so we're like, oh, well, let's go back and look at the serotonin waveform and try those switching potentials that tend to activate the surface, cause surface roughness, maybe some surface oxygen groups. Um, and so in this one, we kept it very similar um, there, although I think we downed the um, 600 volts per second. What do you use? Oh, you use a thousand. Okay, she uses a thousand volts per second. All right. Um, basically, trying to change everything, just just to change the, the potential, and it does tend that you um, tend to get um, you get a higher you're going to get a higher sensitivity because we're going to activate the surface, and also we didn't find the Jackson waveform to be all that low fouling. Um, and by going up to this potential, you essentially clean the electrode off. So if a polymer does form, you can break some of the bonds on it, right, you know, and get it to come off. Uh, and so it's a lot less fouling and higher sensitivity. Not quite as selective, but still pretty good um, comparatively. I would like to, though, for um, completeness sake, say that the do what I'll call the dopamine waveform, which is just the standard uh, minus 0 0.4 to 1.3, is a very good waveform for serotonin. Uh, people just, because this was invented, and then everyone said, well, this is how you have to use serotonin. Um, and then they went and changed the switching potential up to 1.3. Um, this is very good. In fact, a little known fact in the FSCD world is that the sensitivity or the current that you get uh, for serotonin is greater than that for dopamine. Uh, in fact, a lot of times we want to get equal currents, we'll have to down the serotonin, you know, oh, we'll try 500 nanomolar serotonin or 200 nanomolar serotonin is equivalent to one micromolar dopamine. Um, so you get really good, don't put, this is not a dopamine selective waveform by far. It's great for serotonin. In fact, in a lot of experiments, I think we could just use this, especially in the fly brain, and we would be fine. It's just that's not what convention says you should use. Uh, but it's, it's really good um, uh, for serotonin. You get pretty good sensitivity and all of that.